Hey everyone, and welcome to the Knowledge Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Arbilla, the lead mentor at the Knowledge Exchange, where we help clinicians in private practice apply a BPS approach into their clinical practice. We've got a few in-person courses coming up, the closest one being August 20 and 21. We are live in person in Brisbane for our low back pain and BPS practice course. So check out all the details on our website, tkex.org, and join in our discussions on our Facebook group. Today, I've got a very special guest from all the way across the other side of the globe, Mr. Cameron Fowler. He's a physio and educator based in Michigan, has been putting out some amazing content, and I'm super excited to dive into his story, his journey, and some of the act and process-based therapy concepts, as well as what to do about a lot of the misinformation or misconceptions about evidence-based practice as clinicians. So Cameron, thank you very much for making the time for us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Daniel. Always uh, appreciative to communicate with you and, and to, uh, to talk about all these great things that we try to live out and, and experience in our own lives. So um, what do you got for starters? Got the famous question, mate. The What's your story? Speaking of experiences, what's been, what's your journey been like? Yeah. Yeah. So I know I was kind of chatting with Daniel a little bit. It's uh, I think around eight, 11, his time and six, 11, my time. If we flip flop those, I'm much more energetic at six o'clock, uh, eight o'clock in the morning. So we'll, we'll see how this works at this evening time. I tend to get off on tangents and speak really quickly. So, so try to slow things down. But my story is I was, um, Graduated from physio school in 2018, so I've been a practicing physio for the last four years. Now, I was kind of one of those unique students where I think I kind of started to become a lot more curious in school. Of I was listening to a lot of different podcasts uh, in the beginning. Just pain reframe was one of them. Uh, modern pain cast pon, modern pain podcast was another one that was kind of talking about all these things we were learning in school and how they didn't really have the utility of what we saw in the clinic. So I would ask a lot of questions and kind of get concrete answers, knowing that there doesn't exist to be concrete answers. So I always had this little bit of curiosity that built with me. And after graduating and becoming a physical therapist in 2018, I love the outpatient world. I love business aspects. I'm a very business-driven individual. So I worked for a private practice for, I worked there for three years, but about a year and a half into it, I became a clinic manager, and with that, I thought with this title, I'd be able to kind of do the things I wanted to, practice the way I wanted to, and here in the States, it, it doesn't always work that way, so I almost kind of felt like a glorified babysitter. We're still preaching a lot of marketing material that kind of infiltrates this, uh, this quote-unquote bullshit or kind of just non-evidence-based care, so even though I was the status I wanted to be, I wasn't necessarily someone who I thought, saw myself as. Well, long story short is there's another colleague of mine. His name's Leonard Van Gelder. He's been on Daniel's podcast. He's the owner of a clinic here called Dynamic Movement and Recovery and an educational, um, educational company called Dynamic Principles. And I know Daniel has been graciously enough to share some of that stuff. Uh, since a lot of our thought process is aligned, he, he recruited me. He asked me, he said, hey, I got this initiative. Would love to have someone come help and, and, and make this project a success. So I ended up putting in my notice to my one company and joined Leonard. And I've been here a little bit over nine, eight, uh, nine, 10 months or so. And I've been loving life since. So able to incorporate a new framework that Dynamic Principles has been building and refining and, and testing and, and trying to perform some good validation and research into, which is, goes into a lot of the process-based theory that we can get into. And you know, trying to implement what we're teaching into what we're doing, constantly challenging each other, constantly challenging ourselves to see how can we provide better care for our community, and how can we at least provide some better, um, you know, education or provide some sort of material that gets uh, a little bit more of the medical industry a, a better understanding of some of the complexities and nuances with pain. But that's needless to say how I got to my point where I'm at, and yeah. So cool. And you can really hear the, we were talking before the recording that the having a community that can challenge us as well can help us grow. And I really love that, that value you, you all have um, at Dynamic Principles of, of continually challenging, continually improving. Um, so we're not just staying in our echo chambers. Um, so there's a bit of 
nuance and complexity with with pain to say the very least so if if you're not being challenged you're probably not along the right track fair to say for sure sure. and um with that we can also touch on some of the the ideas of how maybe our marketing material might not be as coherent to our our clinical practice as you put up some really great thought-provoking posts on social media um but before that maybe we'll dive into your journey with 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 act so acceptance and commitment therapy, process-based therapy. We had Leonard on talking about it, but I'm really curious to hear how your journey was. Um, it often starts with a personal experience and a way that it resonates with us in our own life story. So what's been your journey? Yeah, and you know, it's 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 funny you say that. And I, I think Leonard and I had a little bit of a different experience in, in how we both came to some conclusions and realizations. It's an interesting as we share our perspectives. And I would say, you know, I, I was fully aware of a lot of biases I had, and I really challenged myself, but process-based therapy theory was essentially the Dunning-Kruger effect on me, that I called myself a process-based therapist. I said I was doing process-based care. I'm like, yeah, you know, you go through and you look at these different things and you try to process through them, and then you really dive into the literature and you're like, oh, like, there's so much more to, there's so much more of this expansive material that I didn't even recognizing that how reductionist I was making it in my clinic. And, you know, you talk about that coherence in the concepts of, I was trying to do a process-based, you know, theory or process-based therapy in the context of just a biomechanic, uh, biomedical lens, you know, um, McKenzie MDT framework. I, I know that's one of those, uh, those uh, coursework that, that they, you know, they, they give themselves a lot of praise for, for kind of, being that process space. And I was taking a lot of courses into McKenzie and kind of going down that. And then actually by taking a step back and, and looking at the, the, the context of how we use McKenzie and, and the theories that, that we get to, to actually um, utilize a lot of those, those um, interventions, to me is like, no, this is just a protocol that may be masking itself as process space there. So it, it's another one of those things that I read a few articles on ACT, I get ACT, but again, actually diving into the literature and looking at where some of these fundamental philosophies and these principles and these theories truly stem from in the process-based theory world and how ACT did, um, it was like a big light bulb shift for me of recognizing, again, bringing out that curiosity. There's a lot to this that I was kind of just overlooking and I didn't really understand, which just began a lot of questioning and, and wondering. And I think it needed that big step back for me from, from recognizing, again, you know, as we talk about even the biopsychosocial model and approach, the, the common theme is that everyone creates some more of a biomedical dominance to it, that, that we're so mechanically inclined that we just learn everything through a pathoanatomical lens. And even though we might be embracing ACT or this process-based ther- uh, therapy, from one perspective, we're still doing it under a biomedical lens. And we might be trying to implement psychological interventions or psychologically informed care, but we're still doing it under a biomedical lens versus stepping back and recognizing that there's a completely new, you know, there's completely different philosophies of science, such as uh, uh, functional contextualism and looking at theories that are built off a contextualistic worldview that make it a lot more coherent and, and for me, it was that loss of co- coherence that truly was a trigger of, I was saying one thing, but my actions were doing a different thing. And then by embracing a little bit more of that uncertainty and embracing a little bit more of that, trying to find out how do I dive in deeper into this process-based theory, uh, theory? How do I dive in deeper into these, you know, the way we utilize that clinically to, to aid our clinical decision-making how do I look back to some of my root beliefs and my, my root metaphors that I'm using to create these theories? And then how can I apply that in a more of a context, contextualistic worldview? And so it's still something I'm working on and it's still something I think I'm learning and growing with, which I don't think, you know, just like everything else, there will never be an end game, but something to continue to push yourself towards. Yeah, ironically, the journey into a process-based approach is a process in itself and continually yeah. unpacking it. I think uh, credits to you because it takes a lot of efforts and and I'm definitely on my own journey and, and looking at some of the discrepancies, kind of like you've uh, highlighted in, in university, we get taught a certain paradigm with certain assumptions. 
Mm-hmm. But then we go into clinical practice and we come across the research and there is that kind of disconnect or, or lack of coherence. And in a very similar way, you, you've really cool to hear your curiosity to continually reflect and challenge yourself and see where that discrepancy might even continue where we can, you know, unintentionally pay a bit of lip service to a BPS approach, but still be practicing through that same lens. It's like a, I think I've heard an analogy of, having certain rose colored sunglasses and seeing the world through those sunglasses, not realizing that everything is still through that same lens and framework until you take those sunglasses off and realize, Oh, Hey, I've actually been going through a specific lens. There's so many other lenses that I can look at. So you can Mm -hmm. zoom out and look at the entirety of the context of definitely can resonate with being stuck in those same sunglasses for quite a few years yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think the efforts come into the concepts of when you're working clinically, you know, if, if you're a clinician that's stuck working with people that are stuck, you're, you're going to continue to hit this brick road. And, and I think one thing for me is that it, it was a big challenge for me to be willing to step into that world. Or I guess a big challenge to, to, to have had the comfort to take those sunglasses off or those glasses off and, and see see what else could be out there. What else can, is there to explore? And it's a lot of those concepts that we utilize with our patient and our patient care. And, and, and as they are stuck in their own, you know, theories and beliefs and perceptions, getting them to recognize just the, the complexity and the nuances and how much we don't know, we don't know exist out there. It's a, just like patients, we can get into that trap ourselves. Yeah, I think what would be helpful is, is, reflecting on some of the the benefits to having this you know lots of effort to reflect and zoom out into the context and start seeing um where there might be uh ways that you can fill in those gaps to make your clinical practice and your theory more coherent what what have been the benefits of this process for you of of applying more of that process-based therapy of of challenging yourself for benefits for you as a clinician and also for your clinical practice. Yeah, I, I would say one one big thing that you know has been has been something I've been challenging myself, and I challenge a lot of our clinicians is developing that concept of confident ambigu- ambiguity. So, having the confidence to know how can I enter in in some of these processes, or how can I reflect and make change in some of these processes. But having that ambiguity in the concepts of there's still so much out there that we might not be able to touch or there's so much out there that that we don't even know that's interacting in this meantime. So it's it's that ability that even though there's so much to this complex world of pain, I at least have a good idea and have a good clinical decision making, um, you know, aids in the concepts that we can enter in in these specific processes and be able to maybe make some changes, which should in theory reflect and make changes everywhere else. But building that curiosity and understanding, there might be other avenues I need to step in at, or I might need to step out of there and enter in another different process. So I love that, the confidence in the uncertainty or the ambiguity. So we can Mm -hmm. still have that, uh, both the humility, the curiosity, and and also the, the idea that we can still influence, have some kind of effect. So it's not like uh, the classic nihilistic view that nothing matters or or everything can work. Yeah. yeah. I'm assuming you've come across that framework. What would you say about the kind of, um, I guess, the attitude that we can have where we can still have both the idea that there's lots kind of outside of our control, but there's also still at the same time things that we can influence? Yeah. And I mean, I guess to just to even go back to some of my experience, I would, I would say I was that nihilistic individual a couple of years ago. I, I was going through the motions. Some people are going to get better. Some people aren't, you know, we'll, we'll do this. I, you just become complacent in, in a lot of what you do. And I, I, I mean, I know how it is in the States because I see it and we talk about a high rate of burnout and I feel for a lot of clinicians just because I, you know, they get this lack of engagement and the people that are truly committed and devoted might be diving into this evidence, but when all you see in the world is this is nihilistic perspectives and this concept of nothing works then complacency builds, you know, culture kind of becomes a little bit more less engaging, that that reward becomes less, you know, beneficial. So I think it's a big struggle that we hit in just our healthcare industry as a whole. But, you know, having that person, like, I mean, for me, it was Leonard's really challenging me and opening up that, 
that opportunity to, to recognize there, there's better ways of looking at things as long as we're willing to do so. And um, again, here I go getting on my soapbox and I kind of forget the main point as, as we're talking about it, but it, it's recognizing that for patients, that, that coherence and the concept of they want to know what's causing their pain. They want to know why they have pain. And at least by diving into some of these processes and keeping the curiosity open, I would say a majority of them are, can get fully on board with some of these concepts and can get a little bit better understanding that there's a lot of pain that they don't understand and they're okay with that. And there's a lot of pain that they know that they can make changes, but it's not like it's just this one tissue or it's just this one bone or this one facet. So it gives you an opportunity to still recognize that, no, we can't reduce pain to a single cause or single pathoanatomical mechanism, but there's a lot of things that we can recognize and how they are constantly interacting and you know are constantly intertwined with each other, reflecting and responding amongst each other. And you know, I, at least from my own experience, I very rarely have any issues with people you know, that, that struggle with that. I mean, it might take a little bit to, to build their understanding, but struggle with that, still that concept of what is pain and why do I have pain, I guess. Yeah. So it's having that uh, ability to reflect on our own experiences and see all the contributing factors. And I guess that gives us a little bit of freedom, like not only for our, our clients or people experiencing pain, that there are lots of ways that they can influence their experience, but also for clinicians that we don't have to get stuck into one certain paradigm and, and be limiting ourselves to that paradigm. We can expand out and see how many different ways we can approach and, and help a human having that, that pain problem. Yeah. If we were to reflect on some turning points uh, that perhaps was the most helpful for you, you mentioned you've had a support network, you've had someone like like Leonard challenge you and, and provide that, that guidance through the process of um, going from where you were, say, three years ago, or maybe in the nihilistic kind of um, bubble. I definitely can notice that myself. I can feel like there's, you know, only so much we can do and it's horrible and the healthcare industry is going downhill. That kind of uh, thought process goes through my mind. What were some of the, the helpful turning points towards where you are now? It's a great question. You know, honestly, I don't know if I've thought that much in depth of to those turning points. Um, I love the book. I think I, I, I might butcher the title. I was uh, being wrong. That's the title, Catherine Schultz, being wrong. And it goes into uh, a lot of times beliefs and how we come to beliefs and how we, we shift. And when you look at the data, we're horrible historians <laughs> in that. And, and we don't do the best job of understanding, you know, when those beliefs change. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this perspective that I know that there was a lot of processes going on and I might be able to come up with some good ideas. And for me, I think a lot of it was engaging, engaging with the right individuals that challenged you, um, reading lots of different just books in, in this context. Um, for me, I think I stepped away from reading a lot of literature that was, quote unquote, just the randomized control trials, exercise versus manual therapy and exercise and manual therapy combined versus placebo and all of these things that are just trying to reduce, again, what's going on in the clinic, which is multiple different processes all at one time and started engaging in a little bit more of what does the psychological literature say from, you know, psychologists? What does uh, philosophy say from a lot of different philosophers? How do I engage with some of their expertise and their perspectives from what the lens they grew up in and mixing it with my own biases and beliefs? So, I think that shift happened probably a good year and a half or two years ago. And, you know, just again, surrounding yourself by good individuals that continue to challenge you and, and help you, I don't want to call it reframe, but at least think of different ways to think about things was, was probably some of those pivotal points. Yeah. Also, it's like the added, uh, having that support community to bounce ideas off. So you're not feeling isolated. I think that's a common thing that can happen if we're in a private practice scenario or context where well, we might be having all these questions, but not having that support network to bounce these ideas off. So we feel like we're alone in, in this nihilistic world view of healthcare and also expanding our own bubbles into the philosophical or psychological lenses. Um, Cause we kind of forget that other healthcare professionals also 
deal with pain too. And they've been dealing with it for a while. We're kind of stuck in our own silo from based on our own university experiences and, and having that reductionistic lens. Uh, yeah. And maybe expanding away from not only the typical RCT that looks at intervention versus intervention to, you know, VAS score and what was the pain reduction mm -hmm. score and, oh, it was nothing much. So nothing much works. Can get into a bit of a, uh, can dig ourselves into a bit of a hole there and, and continue on that nihilistic path. So instead expanding that context and having people around us think that might be helpful for the listeners. Yeah. If we were to go into maybe some definitions, um, one of the common ones in, in ACT, and I think you've covered it really well in some of your content, was psychological flexibility or, or even the concept of psychological inflexibility. Um, if mm -hmm. we were to, to explain that for our listeners, what, what is the, the term, what does it signify, and how might it look in clinical practice when working with patients? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, obviously we hear a lot of different terms, whether it's cognitive flexibility, psychological flexibility, um, psychological variability is, is another term. So there's, it's, it, I, and just to kind of go back to one part first, cause this is funny. I read a lot of literature and books around relational frame theory which that can be mind blowing about how we come to formulate words and how the words I say are just arbitrary in the concept that you are have some sort of understanding and meaning. So again, I, I as I learned about that, you, you think about psychological flexibility and how just even those little semantic terms can change the perception of someone's viewpoint or someone's understanding of it. But the, Man, the so, so true. I just wanted to point that out because <laughs> yeah. like even uh, talking about a certain term with uh, whether it's a, a patient or a clinician, we can have our own assumptions. And I really wanted to highlight mm -hmm. that point that we might be having the same, you know, outward content of the word, say, polystic or lots of factors involved or BPS, but they have a different definition because we haven't really outlined our own definition. So I think that's a yeah. super important point to highlight. Yeah. But again, I mean, I think, and, and even part of this is, is a lot of people learn through metaphors. I mean, we, we already use the, the, sun, the glasses, uh, seeing the rose colored world and taking glasses off. And it's a way that we can kind of at least relate to some sort of cohesive meaning. And again, from physios and, and mostly the movement professionals, a lot of people understand the concept of heart rate variability. Heart rate variability in the concepts of you know, if you have better, or I guess you could say there's some devices that show you have improved variability, which means that you have the opportunity to kind of make changes a little bit easier in that heart rate based on what's going on in the environment and the context you're around. Um, people with lower variability obviously struggle with that. So if they go from a large run and then they're, they go to a walk, it's going to take longer for that heart rate to actually, you know, change or, or decrease. So psychological variability or flexibility can be very similar. I mean, it's not a continuum. It's not like you either have it or you don't. And then this is the dichotomous world. Everything's a yes, no, you either have it, you don't. But pretty much everything that exists in, in our world is always somewhere on this continuum. And it's finding out where people might sit and how we might be able to make certain trends one way or the other. And so with psychological flexibility, it might be related a little bit more to their ability to... Um, fuse or defuse. So whether they're stuck in a lot of thoughts or beliefs or certain emotions and they're constantly fused and ruminating over that, they might say that they have a lack of or a psychological inflexibility or a lack of that psychological variability. Can we get to a context that they can perform some sort of defusion, improving their openness, awareness of there's a lot of other thoughts, meanings, emotions that can be exist that you don't have to can continuously just fuse on this one thought. Um, and again, this, this comes in, I think ACT does a good job in uh, understanding that it's less about control and more about that awareness piece, that there's going to be times in your life where you need to demonstrate that, that psychological inflexibility. You need to be able to fuse. If you're, if you're a surgeon performing a surgery, you need to be able to fuse to that. But then you also need to be able to pivot shift and, and show some you know, variability in that if something changes. Vice versa, if you're an individual that, you know, you're struggling with some sort of pain, emotion, or, or you know, maybe this kind of this, um, this thought that my body's broken or my body's damaged, 
we got to be able to figure out a little bit more flexibility to improve that awareness, improve that opportunity to kind of defuse and, and recognize that, you know, there's a lot more to this than just your thoughts or, or what you believe. I hope that does an okay job explaining it. Um, Absolutely. I think it's, um, it's a way to the common word, as you mentioned, is reframe, but maybe it's more of a zooming out into noticing mm -hmm. the, the thoughts, the stories, or the, the like the common a clinical scenario is having a person with persisting pain attach themselves to a specific tissue-based pathoanatomical diagnosis or commonly multiple diagnoses from a few clinicians at a time. And, and that's their identity. That's their story. And yeah. they, they are unable to see past that. So having a ways in the clinic to get them to observe it and become aware of it, uh, rather than I think a common misconception in that space is to like distract them away from it. Um, mm -hmm. So instead we're, we're just noticing, we're just acknowledging um, using some skills and some tools there and movement can be one of those yeah. ways as well. It, would you be able to expand on, on how maybe movement might be in itself a way for a, a patient? If you have a, a, an example in mind or a scenario that's common um, to help them see there's a lot more, in their story or there's a lot more that they can do um, when they're so fused and stuck into their narrative. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of different, I, I love to just call them movement experiments, number one. So, and, and you, you did a good job explaining it. Um, again, if this was six o'clock in the morning, I might be able to give you a better definition. Uh, Todd I'm Cash putting on the spot here. Yeah, Todd Cashin, I believe, was the author. He, he's got a pretty good literature that dives into psychological flexibility. So if anyone's interested, um, that he, he does a good job kind of breaking it down. But, you know, so how what are some ways we can diffuse with movement? And, and we got to utilize movement experiments. We got to create some sort of, we got to use the context and the environment in, and figure out. One thing I love to do is uh, with, with that concept called like expectancy violation where you know you, you might get someone to perform a specific movement and let's just say they they fear bending their spine because they think that if they bend over then they're going to break their back and they're going to have a disc herniation but what if i challenge them to maybe go on their hands and knees and just kind of rock back and forth and and it changes the context from them it changes the meaning and then when they figure out that they're actually bending their spine and it might not be as dangerous or as bad it creates this little curiosity for them. It pokes holes in their own theory that if I bend my spine, I'm going to be broken. And the moment you can get someone to kind of build that curiosity themselves or poke holes in their own theory, they begin to think. Because we can tell people all we want and we can show them pictures and images, but getting people to realize something themselves is so much more magical and beneficial because that's them learning through experience. And then other ways, it, let's just say maybe someone's still fused on a thought a little bit or a specific emotion, but we don't need to go down that road. It's it's being able to be comfortable exploring certain movements, not assigning a good or a bad to it. So, you know, a lot of times we do this with the concepts of sitting, standing, walking, and we just explore how does it feel slouched versus up tall? How does it feel if we make little shifts? And if they say it's tender or discomforting, you kind of just acknowledge it and say, you know, it's, can we work with that a little bit? Can you give it permission to be there? Can we explore? Does this change you afterwards or whatnot? And, and with that, people are getting a little bit more comfortable exploring that and being okay, being in a little bit of tension and discomfort versus what you were kind of mentioning earlier, that distraction or avoidance. I need to avoid it. I need to push it away. I got to distract myself. I got to control it. Because, you know, usually the more you resist something, the more it's going to persist. So how can we learn to make that a little bit more workable? Those are those are kind of two specific ways that I usually go about it with that movement. Yeah, love it. It's it's so such a rewarding experience to provide that context for a, a person who's been experiencing very real suffering and, and getting them to actually explore and, and be with some tolerable level of that discomfort. I think that's it's such a really amazing ex experience to even observe. It's like a privilege for us to have that that space for them to create that safety when they've been told all these rules and all these uh, danger messages in in their past experiences. So we're using that that context and that environment for them to be curious with their own experience. And and I, I often wonder if clinicians, if we also had that 
experience ourselves, what that might mean to our own practice if we were to have our own exploration, our own uh, reflection with our willingness, maybe with our own pain and injuries. What are your thoughts there? Have you ever um, had yeah. that come across your mind when, when maybe um, having a discussion? It's like, I, I get where you're coming from. It, I just really think you deserve a bit of experiential learning <laughs> to, to yeah. go through it because you're right. Like nothing, everything you're saying makes complete sense based on your experience. You just haven't so, had the experience yet. Yeah, this, this, this is a challenging thing for me. And I would say, so the clinic, the clinic that I operate is, is a very specific niche clinic that we're all operating under this framework that our educational company, Dynamic Principles, teaches, which human rehabilitation framework. And it takes a lot of the principles from ACT and expands upon it a little bit more into adding in a little bit more physical rehabilitation, you know, um, strategies into it as well. But needless to say, we challenge a lot of our clinicians to, again, go above and beyond, go above and beyond the evidence and go above and beyond what most clinics do. Most individuals that we have have gone through some sort of pain experience themselves. And, and this is that concept. And I love to use, I love to use um, like Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 step program. And if you ever read into that, the 12 step is always service member to another. And believe it or not, there's a lot of research that once you complete something and you can provide that service to someone going through something similar, you learn so much better and you continue to be held accountable and it, it just works out well. My unique experience is I am not someone that has ever struggled with pain. I, I've had aches and pains, but I grew up in a very blue collar family. And, you know, I don't know if you want to call it just kind of pushing through things, but needless to say is that pain is not something I encounter on a daily basis. I'll get aches and pains, but I've kind of just, maybe you could say I have already a predisposition to good psychological flexibility. I can kind of work with it, deal with it. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't, you know, knock me down. So a lot of our clinicians that have been through pain already have a good awareness and have kind of come through it themselves. It's a big challenge for me. And this is something that I'm trying to do and challenge myself of truly practicing what I preach. And when I'm, when I'm testing out patients and when we're performing techniques, it's like I'm able to actually see some noticeable shifts in them and things that they're figuring out. But it's even much more challenging for me to do it because I'm just I guess I've not been in that context. But with that, I mean, I think it's making me grow and, and reflect as an individual of trusting the process of letting individuals know like it's that it's that context of a lot of times we're not going to notice that quick fix or that quick relief. So it's being able to get people to be held accountable over a certain period of time to be able to stick with it because no one's going to make big changes for someone that's had pain over 10 years. It's really going to be little changes over time that build and build and build upon each other. So at least with that experience, I can at least share my own uh, thoughts and my own um, opportunities that I've been going through. But I got to say, it's it's been a challenge for myself. It, it's been something I'm not used to. It's countercultural. It's something I didn't grow up with. So in that essence, it helps me relate to people. But in the context that I still am at a point where it's hard for me to notice those changes, just because I'm not been the one in pain. I, I'm not. I'm not. Then I'm not living their life. So that's where you meet that inner subjective third space. How does my experience relate to your experience, but we can meet in the middle and, and maybe that's helped. Maybe that's hindered. Um, we see some people like individuals that have gone through something similar and we see sometimes they respect that. I have not So we'll see it going forward. Yeah. I think that's awesome. That shows a, a lot of uh, honest self-reflection and, and, and vulnerability to notice that uh, we may not have the experiences that someone else has, but we can at least be aware of that the priors, our base, our own uh, biases and experiences to then be able to help the person. Because if we don't acknowledge that, hey, I, I have no idea what it's like to, to go through what you're going through. Um, if yeah. we don't like almost sometimes even it's helpful to say that out loud um, to validate their experience. If we don't have that as a first step, I think it's very difficult to even enter that into subjective like third space between you know, our experience and their experience to meet in the middle and help them. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we could dive into that for, for hours. It was so yeah. fascinating to, to really reflect. And I think it's, it's awesome. Like your role modeling, what, what clinicians um, would all, we'd all benefit from doing. I think we are very easy. I think we've been taught to separate ourselves from our patients, have that kind of power imbalance. So I think it's helpful yeah. to reflect even 
now on our own experiences with pain. Yeah. If we were to segue into discussing with other clinicians, um, maybe when they haven't had these experiences or they haven't had this ex exposure to um, more of a functional contextualism framework, or they haven't had the opportunity yet to reflect on their quote unquote sunglasses. What might be some helpful steps when navigating some of these conversations with, with colleagues, with other healthcare professionals, um, especially if we've had, say, a, a shared case or shared patient? Yeah. It, I, I mean, I guess if there's one thing I learned from my prior experiences of working in that other you know, clinic is that this was a, this was a daily task for me, is, is that I could not share patients with other clinicians because what I was saying and what they were saying didn't mesh. You know, I'm in an environment now where we are constantly communicating with each other. We constantly know where we are with our patient caseload. I am much more comfortable saying, you know, go with this person or you're going to see this person today. So it, it does create a different dynamic. Um, but engaging, engaging with others that maybe have differing beliefs or engaging with others that, that want to step into this realm. And to me, it's something I thoroughly enjoy. And the reason why I thoroughly enjoy it is because what social media tells us and how most people are kind of just evolved into is the world is divided by good and evil. And you either are with me or you're against me. And again, we can go back to, I, I love to just say, it's not yes, no, there's always this continuum. There's always this spectrum. We're a lot more alike than what most people think. We're in the middle. We either just kind of trend one way or the other. But whenever I engage with someone, it's always an engaging to, to learn to see if we can have a better understanding of where both of our perspectives are. And so part of that, you know, and, and I don't know if this was the, the route you wanted to go into um, in that context. So Part of that is just, you know, seeking permission and saying, hey, it looks like, you know, maybe our beliefs or maybe some of what we do is a little different. I'd love to learn a little bit more of why you believe those certain things, share why I believe it and see if we can come out stronger of understanding this thing. And I, I think Adam Grant does a good job in, in some of his writings and his work, his Think Again, because because he describes this in pretty good depth. And, and I mean, most of my, I would say I'm pretty biased to a lot of his writing. So most of this does come from some what, what he what he puts out. But again, you're, you're, you're engaging not to change their beliefs, but you're engaging just to, to build perspective and build more curiosity. And I think for me, and, and we can tie back into when you poke holes in, in patients' expectations, when you poke little holes in those theories, you can get people to start thinking. So in essence, when we're looking at stuff, I just try to see if we can poke holes in some of their theories or make little question marks of why that may be. And you can just leave it there and let it sit. And, you know, some people are willing to engage and continue to learn. And, and it's that conversation piece of how can we continue to, to build upon this and understand where there's a little bit more cohesion. And then other times, you know, it takes a little bit more because people might have some sort of something cost or they're, they're truly, you know, they've truly devoted half their life to believing one specific thing. And it's, you know, challenging that's like challenging who they are. It's challenging their identity. They, they don't want to not believe anything else. So it's also recognizing your opportunity to, to, you know, how, when, when should I pivot or is it worth it in the context or just can you at least understand where I'm coming from and what I'm trying to do? Um, and again, we can continue to get into the, some more of this, I guess you can say, um, beliefs or evidence-based medicine, but what, what were your thoughts, Daniel? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's such a common um, topic amongst conversations and I, I do mentoring with clinicians in private practice and that's definitely uh, one of the challenges is when maybe some colleagues or, or when sharing a patient, some other healthcare professionals might not have uh, the same lens or frameworks or philosophies. Um, and again, it's not that it's, like you said, good philosophy versus evil philosophy. It's different. And how can mm -hmm. we merge together to see our commonalities and to and reflect uh, our own beliefs to have a, that common shared value and goal to help the client. So I think it'd be right. awesome. Like what are some ways um, and some strategies that you found helpful either firsthand or, or from vicarious experience? Yeah. And, and again, I think it's, it's, it's the, to, to me, it comes down to communication. You know, it's, it's how we communicate the intent and the purpose of why we're communicating, um, 
the, the, the meaning you want to get out of the communication. And this is, this goes into patient care. This goes into uh, uh, colleagues. This goes into relationships that in general, we suck at communication and that what I perceive myself saying and what you what I perceive you hearing is completely different than what you're going to hear and what you think I'm saying. And so, you know, I, I think we, we have this essence where there's a kind of like this fear of conflict. We can't conflict with someone else and it's okay to embrace that and, and just acknowledge that, that, Hey, I want to have this conversation with you just because I feel like there's some differing views and differing opinions. Hopefully we can come out at the end a little bit stronger and understanding both of our perspectives and, and, and addressing it that, acknowledging like sometimes these are difficult conversations we have. We do this with patients. Sometimes we have to have difficult conversations and just acknowledging, I'm going to have a difficult conversation with you. Are you, are you okay? Seek permission. Are you okay if we engage in some of this? And, and when, when someone gains you, gives you that permission, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's have a conversation. And then at the end, let's see if we can at least create some sort of clarity. This is my understanding of where you're at. This is your understanding of where I'm at. And again, when it comes to patient care, it, it always should go back to the, the person. It should always go back to what's going to be beneficial for them, and and how can we at least provide some sort of some sort of cohesion in the concept that we're not just you know you're saying it's a muscle, you're saying it's a bone, and the patient's going home confused. Like, how do, how do we how do we build upon that? And believe it or not, I, I think even when it comes to patients, the less words we use, the better it is. <laughs> So, so we, we do a lot of talking and a lot of educating, a lot of telling people versus it's okay just to give them thoughts and let them, let them process through things and, and let them try to come up to their own conclusions. And then you can help guide that one direction or or the opposite. And if it's something that's meaningful for them and taking them in a meaningful direction, that's not resulting in any harm. there, There should be no reason why we need to, to basically, you know, stop that, I guess. So it's, we can, really have that opportunity to to show not tell in the, in that clinical consultation and even now I'm, I'm also noticing it's easier with clinician to clinician uh, when we have a shared client because it's always going to mm-hmm. be back to that shared client it's almost like using that uh, self as context or observation self where we can separate our own identities to even though we might have quote unquote different frameworks and identities and beliefs um, yeah. We can still help the person in front of us and get them to their to their meaningful goals. So I think it's much much easier in, in that context. Um, when when it comes to other contexts, perhaps it one option may be bowing out and acknowledging that it might not be a, a suitable, safe, productive, collaborative context on say a social media post or 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 group um, to have an open, honest. Um, communication because it's so much harder it kind of reminds me of all those memes of text messages and how they can be misinterpreted you, you don't really yeah. see the person right you don't see yeah. you don't really understand where they're coming from or you don't know their intentions through a you know persona through a screen right i, I mean you got it you hit the nail on, on the hammer and again even even understanding you know as, as it comes back to language the non-verbals the tone the environment like we, we get none of that, you know, through social media. We get none of that through writing. And ever since COVID's hit our world, a lot of things have become virtual. You know, we're going to send email messages. And, we're, and so, again, there's, I think in the, in the end, it's coming to the realization that we're all more alike than what we think. And when we break it down, it's, it's, there, is, there, is a, there is some sort of similarities that we can always come to conclusions with. And, you know, again, recognizing what's, what's the best and the safest for the patient and I mean, even in my time now, there's times you got to recognize that whatever I'm saying, or there seems to be this barrier with this patient I'm with, but they're excelling well with this clinician. It's not up to me to enter in and I have to save the world. It's up to me to recognize that, step back and say, you got to go continue on with them because I'm not going to help you as much as they are. And I, I don't know if there's just some sort of, you know, egocentric or arrogance in, in some of the culture and that tribalistic cultures we're given. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 we can, we can circle all the way back to some of that nihilistic views. Our theories today are going to be proven wrong tomorrow. So we're, we're constantly trying to get closer to truth. So if we can all recognize that a lot of things do work for individuals, just in different contexts, and recognizing that you know, and and this is where again that process-based reasoning truly comes in the hand, 
that there's not really much you're changing in what you do. You're just changing in how you decide to do it, how you're implementing it, how you're using it to aid decisions. And so it's not a this versus that. It's just how can we enter in and where's the best place to enter in? And I, I do think most people can get on board with that, at least anyone that's truly somewhat um, concordant with reading up to any evidence. But Absolutely. It's uh, it's really cool. It's so flexible, that framework in itself. It's more of the, the how and the, the why rather than just the simple what, which I feel mm -hmm. is, is, is gets into more of that dichotomous view of black or white of good or evil treatments or, or good or evil beliefs. It's, uh, as you said, we're a lot more alike than we might think. Um, if, if we were to segue into some common, it, when it comes to evidence-based practice or even when it comes to uh, process-based therapy or ACT, mentioning that it, it can be common to, to think of, say, diffusion as distraction or, or, or think of um, maybe we can get into our own camps or dichotomous thinking when starting out. I think that's probably a natural way of, of our own journey and learning and understanding and making some mistakes in that process. So what, what might be, based on what you've come across, some common misconceptions about evidence-based practice in the context of process-based therapy and, and ACT? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, again, I think, I think it's owning up to our own biases. And, and like I said early, I, I was aware of my biases, but then the Dunning-Kruger effect hit me like a ton of bricks when you, you, you do recognize like, man, there's, there's a lot more to learn to this than, than I truly did recognize. And we find comfort with things that make sense. And things that make sense are things that we were grown up to believe and we're taught. And so it, it's very natural for us to start to conflate some of that diffusion as we're going to try to control or we're going to go back to symptom modulation. And, you know, I even find myself the way, the way I'm using words in the clinic that I can almost do that at the same time. I'm reflecting on that and I'm like, maybe that's not the best word to use because the patient's re representing that in the concept that we got to get rid of pain, we got to control pain, we got to get out of it. So again, I think with that comes some reflection and, and I'll, I'll reiterate, sometimes it's better when we talk less, and <laughs> listen more. Sometimes it's better when we just try to guide the patient through some of their reasoning. Um, some of the biggest misconceptions though, again, with that process-based therapy is I feel like a lot of people say they're doing it, but when you actually dive into some more of the philosophical um, perspectives of that functional contextualism, it's like we're doing so under one specific lens or one specific protocol. So again, you know, the way that truly process-based therapy can work and exist is that it has enough scope and, and um, depth to handle a diverse range of different conditions and complexities. So there, there's nearly endless opportunities for you to basically enter in. And there's nearly endless opportunities for, for us to really truly reason and process through. And so with that, that's where that uncertainty again built and becoming confident with that uncertainty and recognizing what are some of the strong suits and how can you at least recognize some certain processes and patterns that the patient's exhibiting. And then um, as far as the diffusion goes, this is where it's that dichotomous view that we have to always be diffused. We, you know, if, if you're thinking this, you can't, you can't have any worry, you can't have any anxiety. That goes back into that concept of control. And, and it's very natural for us humans to have worry. It's very natural for us to be anxious. And, and it's building that awareness of it. We're not assigning whether it's good or bad. We might be able to find strategies to diffuse from it, but we can also give our permission to fail. We can give our permission to explore. We can give our permission that it's normal for us to, to, to be fused. It's normal for us to have those feelings. And that's okay. It's okay to recognize that. We just don't want that to overtake or override or really dictate behavior over a long time. So I think it's becoming a little bit more comfortable recognizing that we are humans. We're gonna make mistakes. Uh, flare-ups and those things are inevitable and being more comfortable and aware that that can happen but having good strategies in place to at least try to implement can be beneficial so hopefully that answers your question a little bit definitely it's um back to we can use the same principles and pay lip service to to act but actually upon reflection and this might be where it's helpful to have that community or have other people to bounce ideas off, we, we can notice, ah, oh, I was 
using a movement experiment to reduce someone's pain, or I wanted that aha moment, that expectancy violation to equal pain reduction. Uh, yeah. I think that that's a very understandable and, and normal part of the journey from our own education systems into where we're seeing through a completely new lens, functional contextualism and, and making it about the person's experience and their functional goals, less about chasing that symptom modification. I think that's probably the, the biggest, most common misconception. And I'd say arguably normal part of, of learning this process because I've definitely still catch myself to this day. Oh, realizing and becoming aware that I might have my own control strategies in place when I'm dealing with mm -hmm. a very complex case. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, I, I think part of that comes to, I mean, patients that are in pain, they're, I mean, they're, they're not dumb. They've been through the system. They've seen enough. They, they just want someone to be real with them. And when you're vulnerable yourself and you can admit it, that I'm going to make mistakes, we're not going to do things perfectly. I'm human, you're human. It, it reassures them and provides at least a little bit more comfort that, again, we're just two human beings that are trying to help each other out, navigate this world and, and, and make this world a little bit easier to live in and work in and, and navigate through. And so I, I just, I don't think that patients get that enough, that, that enough realness that there's so much, uh, we tell people what's wrong with them. You're, you're fused, you, you know, you have this inflexibility trait. We got to stop that. You are your four is weak. You, you're not moving well. None of us to actually tell patients what they're good at. You're strong. You're resilient. You've overcame a lot. You have a lot going on. You're still putting effort in to take care of your children. And when people can hear those kind of positive outlooks and when they can recognize that, hey, this is part of the human experience that everyone has their own battles, their own demons they're going through, it becomes a little bit more real that I'm not alone. And, and, and I think for a patient to recognize that being in pain, you know, and, and struggling with it, but I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. That there's other people out there. And one, one effort we're doing, and I would love to, to see this utilized a little bit more, is somehow and uh, in a concrete way develop some sort of like support groups that's a little bit more beneficial. And I, I don't think this is explored enough in the States because like we have a lot of support groups, but sometimes they can feed into each other and just perpetuate some of these symptoms. But how do we create that support group that is instilling a lot of the education we're giving them in the clinic that's instilling a lot of these, you know, these, these uh, abilities and strategies to become a little bit more flexible or to demonstrate a little bit better flexibility but then support each other. Because going back to the Alcoholics Anonymous, that 12-step that program, that 12-step is, I need to service for someone else. And a lot of people that go through their own experience and then become clinicians, they want to help other people that are in their shoes. So we do have that universal kind of trait that we do like to help other people. And here I am again, Daniel, I'm going on my tangent. So I apologize if I'm on my soapbox and, and going on this. It's just, it's just that essence and the effort that, I mean, knowing and telling people and validating for who they are as a human and, and validating it for yourself and recognizing how can we work together? How can we support each other? How can we find a community that supports each other so that we're both growing in, in our lives and, and, and improving in that? So. Hey, I love that. And it's it really talks to the, the value of support networks and communities that we often miss. And especially for people in pain, they go back into their community after say a, a safe context that we create with movement experiments, but they're still given almost the opposite message outside of that. So if we can help support and guide to build our own, say patient support groups, um, there's a few out there that I, I know of. So shout out to Tom Bowen and Amy Eicher, a few pain yeah. coaches, patient advocacy groups. We can create our own. I think there's lots of yeah, yeah hope there that we can, we can foster and build those communities to help support and guide um, that shared vulnerability. There's, there's a huge, huge power in that, and to keep those messages reinforced um, so people know that they're, they're not alone. Um, mate, I could talk for hours and respecting your time after a very busy day in, in the clinic. If we finish off with this question, as long as that's okay with you, with yeah. in regards to some of the, the biggest barriers you'd say to, to implementation, we've touched on a few, we've touched on that, that the term coherence when there mm -hmm. might be a discrepancy between what we're saying and what we're doing. And even perhaps I wonder what, what we're doing and what we're marketing. And there's, so how do we navigate within the constraints of business and, and private practice models? 
um, what might be some of the barriers and, and yeah, what would you say to how we can navigate those barriers to implementing what we've been talking about process-based therapy and definitely plug and shout out to your course and what you're doing. Cause I think that's one of the solutions, but that's my bias. Yeah. Put you back on your soapbox. Well, yeah. I appreciate that. And I mean, again, I, I, I wish I, I had a, a great answer because I mean, these typically it's like, we're looking at systemic issues here and as we touch on the social aspect, I mean, one of the one of the biggest constraints is is the social lives these people live. That what we do in the clinic, they're going to go back into their own social, you know, lives, and that can only change so much. Sometimes we can't change that. Sometimes it is. It's it's amazing how many individuals are sometimes they may be in a toxic relationship or or living in just a, a very marginalized community that there's systemic issues we can't make a change and, and recognizing that and becoming aware of that because we're not going to save the world or anything like that. But like you said, I mean, as far as it goes with barriers, it's, it's truly, it's truly being willing to, to find individuals that are committed and passionate enough to at least move forward and transition into a world they may seem better fit. And I say this because as I have conversations, like a lot of what we're doing is completely unique to where we're at. It's completely unique to the States. Um, Australia, you guys are a little bit ahead of us in, in the research and the literature, I would say, in the coursework. So um, I, I love, uh, shout out to Jared Powell, because he always shares about like 48% of the US clinicians don't view evidence-based practice and all that stuff, but needless to say, whatever that is. Um, but we just, I think we run into this problem where we get committed individuals that go through university. And then again, they're struck with this, these problems, they just, it becomes too overwhelming. So we either become complacent or we just got caught up in, in our own ways. And we don't, you know, it, you, you get that kind of that negativity, but finding people willing to, again, be passionate, committed to, to truly make that change in the healthcare that you want to see. And as we're testing and, and doing our coursework, so with dynamic principles, we have a framework. We're trying to get a little bit more validation through some research. We got great case series that are along with it. We're trying to apply for an NIH grant that can allow us to actually um, look at the feasibility of it, educating other clinicians and seeing the changes in their practices. But even with that and, and understanding the fundamental theories we have of, of trying to create that change in the healthcare world where it becomes more person focused, truly, it becomes a little bit more person, person, person focused. It takes away from that biomedical dominance. And with that, there's just, there's just that comfort that people have. So the constraint of dealing with people stepping into uncertainty, dealing with the constraint that there's just systemic issues we can't control for, dealing with the issues that, you know, again, I'm, I'm committing a lot of time and I'm taking on this challenging environment we see a lot of people of a poorer status. So we get a lot of cancellations and we don't get reimbursed as highly. It'd be much more financially advantageous for me to open up a cash-based clinic, see healthy people that have all the money in the world, make them better and be living life free. But again, that might not be who I want to be. That doesn't sit well with my, my, my context of, I know I can do that, but who I want to be is I want to be that change. So truly, I think it's just getting enough people willing and, and ready to do that. And there's a lot of individuals that have been in the, the clinical world that are, are ready and willing, but truly the new grads are the ones that are like, you've got to capture them before they get too, too caught up. And, and again, I can't speak for Australia, but at least in the States is that we see that cash and that commitment in the new grads. And then you just kind of see this little downward shift that about five, eight years later, it's like, I found my treatment. I'm happy with my life. I'm going to go through the motions. I'm, I'm good with it. So, you know, as, as much as that can answer your question, those are some of the efforts that we're doing is, is by providing our clinical mentorship, by operating our business, by trying to teach other people how we operate our business, by trying to expand our business and provide more care to rural locations, people that don't get the adequate care, people that don't have the resources. And I mean, my, my biggest thing is I love to be challenged. So you talk about a challenge. This, this is truly a challenge, but it's something that continues to be rewarding and fulfilling for me. And we're, we're still pushing forward. So any way we can push forward with more commitment and support, that's what that's the only thing we can ask for. So well said. And uh, there's if, if there was an answer, I think that would definitely be one of many possibilities. It's such a complex problem. I think the social, social determinants of healthcare can definitely get in the way. Uh, so you've made some really great points, some mic dropping moments, Cameron. I'm 
really appreciative of your time for yeah yeah it was, it was a great conversation and some really really deep topics um for the listeners who are keen to find out more about you and, and yeah. get in contact with what you're doing and any projects and um, one day you'll have a course in australia and i'll be there but please <laughs> we gotta make the trip over so yeah um I'm, I'm mostly on Facebook and Instagram. So Cam Fowler, DPT, Doctor of Physical Therapy. Um, I think that's both my Facebook and my Instagram. Email me. Um, so our coursework, Dynamic Principles, you can email me at Cameron at dynamicprinciples.com. I keep that email on me. We got a lot of coursework. We got a lot of new blogs being released. Um, I know I get on my soapbox and I talk really quick when I do things, but if you want a little bit better of a conversation or whatnot, catch me at six o'clock in my morning, six o'clock in the morning, where it's my prime time. Um, but yeah, I love to chat. I love to converse with individuals that are like-minded, that are different like-minded. Love to just continue to, to explore this, this unique world we're living in and, and meet individuals such as yourself, Daniel, and love to continue to expand our coursework wherever we can. So Amazing. You are doing some excellent work over there. So really appreciate all that you do, Cameron. And Appreciate this conversation until the next time. Sounds good, Daniel. Thank you so much.